Marco Schivo. Marco Schivo. Okie dokie. Oh, ooh, wrong way. There we go. All right. Uh, oh, do we need to start the recording too, or no? No. Okay. I, I believe. All right. Someone. So, welcome everybody. Uh, today, it's a pleasure to welcome Marco Schiro, who's going to give us a talk on light control of strongly correlated electrons. Um, and with that, please take it away, Marco. Okay, thank you very much uh, for the introduction and thanks for the for the invitation. Uh, as I was saying, uh, it's a pleasure to give uh, to give this talk for this series that that I have been following uh, during the half time of confinement. Um, so today will be a story about light control and correlated electrons. Let me start by uh, first of all acknowledging the uh, people and my collaborator, the people that. Uh, uh, did this work. So the first part of the of this talk will be a collaboration with um, Olivier Parcolet at the Flatiron Institute in, uh, in New York City and Francesco Peronacci uh, when he was postdoc with us in Paris. And the second part uh, is uh, done by Olesia Dmitruk, uh, who is a postdoc at Collège de France, uh, and more recently also Mathieu uh, joined us as a PhD student. And let me also acknowledge the funding uh, that we um, received for this research, both from the French National Agency and from European um, agents. Okay, so that's the outline of today. Uh, I will start with a, a general motivation uh, on trying to, to understand what we are interested in and why we're interested in it. Uh, and the general theme is like control of non equilibrium quantum matter. And then I will enter in and give two examples of this paradigm. The first one involves driven a strongly correlated system. So driven by classical light, uh, I will use here the word floquet and, and I will introduce what that means in case uh, uh, people here is not familiar. And I'll give you an example that I think is really striking of how you can turn a, a MOT insulator into a, a, an exotic superconductor using, using light. And then uh, depending on how I'm gonna do with time, I will try to uh, um, switch to uh, the regime in which light needs to be described by quantum mechanics. Uh, uh, and so the driving force are uh, vacuum quantum fluctuations. Very good. OK, so the, the, the first slide is a motivation for, for why we're interested in quantum matter. And I guess if you are uh, here listening to this talk, probably you, you don't need this slide. But the general point that I want to make is that in condensed matter physics, we are interested in emergent collective phenomena. Uh, and, and the most uh, and typical uh, uh, kind of experimental setting for a long time has been focusing on the physics close to thermal equilibrium in a regime of linear response. And in, in this regime, uh, we know that uh, uh, there are a variety of uh, emergent phenomena that, um, that are interesting. Um, at the same time, in, in recent years, uh, thanks to the development of several experimental platforms, some of which I will, I will discuss more in detail in this talk, we managed to uh, achieve a, a new sort of degree of control on um, quantum matter and, uh, that allow us to explore dynamics and time evolution in a regime of uh, quantum coherence. And these uh, experimental platforms range from uh, standard solid state materials, which are excited by ultra fast optical fields. And that will be the mo main motivation for this talk. And uh, at the same time, uh, quantum simulators, either with, with um, atoms uh, uh, trapped in, 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 um, in optical lattices or with quantum optic platforms, also offer uh, uh, the possibility to explore uh, quantum many body physics far, far from equilibrium. So uh, what I uh, have in mind for today are the uh, so-called pump probe experiments, uh, which uh, uh, the idea is sketched here on, on the left of the slide. You have essentially a sample which is excited by two uh, laser beam, one pump create an equilibrium population and, uh, and a subsequent probe uh, uh, laser uh, track some relaxation of the electronic degrees of freedom. And this setting is uh, extremely uh, versatile from the point of view of what kind of a pump uh, frequency you can probe. Uh, and this allows, for example, to couple to electronic excitation, 
but most also most recently to uh, low frequency terahertz uh, uh, range where phonons live, uh, so local vibrational modes or collective modes of superconductors. And the big highlight in this field, uh, one of the main one, at least one of the one one that really uh, got my uh, attention is the uh, series of experiments that uh, uh, reported light induced optical optically induced uh, optically stimulated superconductivity in a variety of families of, uh, of materials from, from cuprates, high temporal superconductors, to more uh, conventional uh, phonon mediated super, superconductors like fullerides, or uh, the family of organic material, uh, materials, kappa salts. And, and on this uh, very uh, latest uh, experiment, I'm I going to spend a couple of words more to try to motivate what kind of model, kind of analysis we're going to present. So these organic materials are um, a layered uh, materials in which essentially you have big uh, molecules, uh, ET molecules, which are uh, arranged in different geometries. For example, triangular lattice, so this is a classic example in 2D, or you can have one dimensional chain. And essentially, uh, the properties of these, um, of these materials can be controlled in thermal equilibrium by changing pressure. Uh, and uh, changing the pressure essentially change the hopping integral and the probability, the rate at which electrons move around in this lattice. And these are textbook kind of textbook example of strongly correlated materials, and they are described by the Hubbard model, which is the Hamiltonian right here that will be sort of our uh, a good friend for the for the rest of this talk. And the Hubbard model capture. Uh, one uh, key uh, physics uh, uh, effect, which is the mode transition, the competition between kinetic energy of the electrons that tends to delocalize throughout the lattice, this first term here, and the Coulomb repulsion, the local Coulomb repulsion, then instead wants to charge, wants to freeze the charge and pay uh, an energetic uh, um, uh, offset, uh, which is the upper repulsion. Uh, for multiple, for double occupation. So as a function of the ratio between these two couplings, you typically have a, have a mod transition between a metal and, and an insulate. And in this material, you have a variety of phases as you change temperature and pressure. But in this talk, we will be interested mostly in, in light control and non-equilibrium control on the properties of these materials. And this is motivated by, by more recent experiments uh, done mostly in, in the group of Andrea Cavalleri, which first show that uh, uh, by shining uh, light uh, um, uh, in, the, in the frequency range where, where vibration, local vibration uh, live, uh, one can effectively modulate in time uh, the upper repulsion of, uh, this, of this material. And the idea is that you pump these phonons, these are these sort of harmonic or weakly harmonic oscillators, QI, and you make them ring and oscillate with some frequency omega. And these phonons are, and these vibrations are coupled to the electronic structure and result in an environment which, and a Coulomb interaction, upper interaction, which modulate in, is modulated. In time, so this is sort of uh, one uh, main uh, motivation for us to sort of look at this kind of uh, dynamical problem. Let me also mention that in the same family and in the same class of experiment, even more uh, striking news uh, came out uh, more recently, uh, showing that in fact uh, uh, by uh, using light, one can um, induce a sort of a transient superconductivity uh, up to temperature uh, which are far higher than what you expect in thermal equilibrium. So to be concrete in the case of these uh, 2D uh, materials, the transition temperature is 12, uh, around 12 K. And, uh, and in fact, the normal phase is a sort of two-dimensional thermoliquid. But if you see this plot uh, here, I, I, I plot from, from this paper uh, by um, uh, Bootsy et al, uh, reflectivity and optical conductivity. And the blue dots are the photo-induced signal after the, the pump. The red dots is the uh, equilibrium um, uh, signal. And you see that essentially that uh, uh, up to a temperature of the order 50 K, you see an almost perfect reflectivity uh, and an optical gap in the real part of the uh, conductivity and a, sort, and a sort of one over omega frequency behavior that is suggestive uh, of a sort of optical gap opening up. Mm -hmm. uh, let me close this, uh, this part of motivation, also mentioning that uh, uh, driven fermi Abbard system are also routinely uh, realized uh, with ultra-cold atoms in optical lattices. And the idea there is to shake 
the lattice, so shake the, the, laser, the, the lattice in order to modulate either the hopping or uh, modulate the magnetic field, which create the, the flashback resonance and the interaction between the atoms. Mm. And so with this uh, few slides, I hope you are all uh, sort of convinced that can be interesting uh, to understand what's going on when you prepare uh, your uh, fermionic system in some initial state, and then you make it uh, evolve with, a, uh, with an interaction that is actually modulated in time. And so, and so we're gonna uh, discuss for the rest of the, for the first part of the talk, how the physics of this problem changes depending on the frequency of this modulation omega and depending on the amplitude of this modulation delta u. And uh, let me also emphasize that uh, we will consider an, a modulation on delta u, an amplitude that such that you never switch uh, the sign of the Coulomb revulsion, of course. So it will be a regime in which the drive the strength remain below the uh, value u naught. And so for the time being, we will start considering this uh, system to be completely isolated from the environment, no external degrees of freedom, no external buff. And then we'll, later on, we will add the, uh, uh, we'll see how uh, coupling to the environment changes the thing. So before, uh, before giving you the, the results of this uh, uh, that we had, let me uh, tell you a, a couple of general things about periodically driven quantum anybody system, just to make sure that uh, everyone is on, on the same page uh, on that, because these are rather interesting uh, uh, new uh, piece of physics that, uh, that, uh, that is being emerging. So uh, when the Hamiltonian of the system is periodic in time, in fact, uh, these are one of the most mostly studied and, and, and in a sense simplest time dependent uh, quantum mechanical problem. So if the Hamiltonian is perfectly periodic and the period here is T is related to the frequency uh, uh, by, by this uh, relation. In fact, uh, uh, there are two ways of seeing this problem. And, uh, one, is, and, the, and one is the so-called Floquet theorem. Uh, and the Floquet theorem tells you that the, uh, the, um, there are a set of natural eigenmodes uh, uh, for, for this problem, which played the same role as the eigenstate of a time independent Hamiltonian. And the form of these Floquet modes, uh, they are uh, uh, given by a periodic function, this uh, phi of alpha, up to and, and a phase. So you see the wave function, the, the solution of the time dependent Schrodinger equation is periodic up to a phase. So this is something that should sort of remind you what you know from textbook solid state, uh, uh, in, in, and that's a block theorem for electrons in a special, uh, specially periodic potential. And that's the sort of the analog in time. And the advantage of that is that essentially you can take time and throw it out of the window and cast this Floquet quantum mechanics into an eigen mode, an eigenvalue problem uh, in, a, in a space uh, uh, which includes your the quantum degrees of freedom and the harmonics of the drive, or if you like, the, the sort of photon, uh, classical photon of, of the drive. Another way of seeing that uh, uh, is by looking, and this is something that has been very useful uh, in, in numerics, is to look at the evolution operator of this Floquet system over a period, uh, this uh, U of T, T in zero. And this enjoyed this uh, nice property that, in fact, if you observe the system stroboscopically, which means after n cycle of the drive, the evolution operator uh, just uh, acts like uh, the uh, you you have to apply n times the same basic evolution operator. So this obviously does not happen in a generic time dependent problem. It happens in a system which is described by an Hamiltonian which is time independent. And in fact, this suggests that some sort of effective Hamiltonian is hidden behind this Floquet, uh, floquet uh, problem. And so people tend to extend uh, to to introduce an effective Floquet Hamiltonian just by this identification by taking the exponential or the log, if you want, of the evolution operator. So this should tell you that uh, already uh, the drive allows you to create effective Floquet Hamiltonian, which a priori might be very different from the uh, Hamiltonian describing the, un describing the undriven system. And this whole idea uh, is what is called and goes under the name of Floquet engineering, which is uh, the idea of use, using drives uh, and periodic drives to control and design and reshape the energy profile of your, of your system. So there is a classic example in classical mechanics that is called the Capizza pendulum, which is essentially the fact that you can take a pendulum where, where, where you, the, the, the equilibrium position is, the rest position is in equilibrium state, but the, the sort of orthogonal position is unstable. You can make it uh, ring 
and dynamically stabilize this unstable, um, unst unstable point. And this flow key engineering has been realized in, in various platforms. Uh, here I'm giving an example that I like particularly, and is the idea of driving with circular polarized light um, a set of fermions. This circular polarized light breaks time reversal symmetry and allows you to create a non-trivial topological state, in fact, the Aldane model, uh, even without a magnetic field. So this is a, a really active field. And, and let me also mention that it's very uh, challenging to, to develop techniques uh, to, to solve this Floquet problem. So a big uh, part of our effort and our time goes into developing new techniques. And I'm highlighting here a couple of those that I won't have the time to, to discuss. But one is the flow equation methods that we have applied to disorder system. And another one is the wave function methods based on exact factorization that is used for electron uh, phonon or electron nuclear uh, problems. Uh, so I gave you this sort of nice picture of Floquet engineering uh, uh, that make us dream that by using light, you can completely reshape the Hamiltonian in the system. There is a sort of dark side of this. There is another side of this problem, which uh, most of you probably sort of expect. And it's the physics of heating. Uh, because of course, once you drive the system, you expect the, the system to absorb energy from the drive and eventually sort of heat up. And you can see that uh, by just doing a very simple linear response calculation, you take your Hamiltonian, you drive it uh, coupling to some uh, operator A, you and you ask, uh, how does this operator change in linear response uh, due to this drive? And if you do this calculation, you in fact find that, uh, find that uh, this, uh, op this observable A uh, goes to a stationary state, which is typically synchronized with the drive up to a phase. And most importantly, if you ask, yourself what is the rate of energy absorption so how much energy in unit of time the system uh, absorbs uh, this energy rate is given by the derivative of your drive times the observable that couples to it so you see this is interesting uh, this energy absorption can go up and down on any time scale because this f is essentially the derivative of this periodic function can be positive and negative but if you integrate this energy absorption rate over a number of cycles, you get this very uh, sensible result that the energy absorption after n cycle is essentially something which is bounded to be positive, is minus the dissipative part of the linear response function. So there's no uh, free lunch. If you drive a system, you will sort of absorb energy, and you have to expect the system to heat up. So, uh, and so the picture, the way we understand that in a quantum many body system goes under the name of, I can say, thermalization hypothesis. And it's the idea that in fact, in the long time limit, sufficiently chaotic uh, and complex and interacting many body system thermalized to thermal equilibrium uh, up by absorbing energy from the drive. And, and in the case of a flow case system, uh, which is a system which do not conserve energy, the obvious uh, long time limit has to be described by an ensemble in which you sort of maximize the entropy without any constraint. And this is the ensemble of infinite temperature. And so I can say thermalization hypothesis under Floquet dynamics tells you that uh, in the long time limit, a system would heat up a many body system, non ergodic many body, ergodic many body system would heat up to infinite temperature. And so this is something that uh, has been seen numerically. Uh, and, and to a certain extent quantitatively understood. And so you might ask the question of sort of what, uh, what's up with all this Floquet engineering we were talking about at the beginning. I, I told you that you can use light and, and make uh, uh, your potential flip and make a minimum uh, become a maximum vice versa. And now I'm telling you that eventually the system will go to a very boring state, which is infinite temperature, where you don't expect anything particularly interesting. And so the sort of way out of that is a concept that uh, it's kind of uh, important in, 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 in non-equilibrium quantum mechanics and uh, quantum anybody physics is the idea of pre-thermalization, namely that might be situation in which, in fact, you go starting from some initial condition, you go to thermal equilibrium very, very quickly. But in fact, there might be region, regimes in which thermalization is parametrically delayed, which means that the system gets trapped into some metastable state, spend some long, parametrically long time around some non-thermal fixed point. This is an idea that was introduced uh, actually in high energy physics uh, and find found application in many, many other fields. And then eventually, 
after some long time reached thermal equilibrium. So there is a, a simple way to understand that, a very simple way, I think, to understand that uh, in the context of Floquet, which is the re regime of high frequency drive. If my drive frequency omega is much bigger than any energy scale in my system, it's kind of obvious that the system does not couple to the drive and is not able to absorb energy. So in that case, we understand now that heating, heating is going to be exponentially slow and energy is almost conserved for an exponentially long time. And, and in that case, uh, you can talk about pre-thermal fluid system and you don't have to worry too much about heating to infinite temperature. What I'm going to talk about uh, today is, in fact, another mechanism for flocated pre-thermalization that I think is much more interesting because it does not require high, high frequency, but actually can happen even with resonant drive, provided that interactions are very strong. So, uh, so with, that, with that said, let me go back to uh, 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 our Hubbard model with optically modulated interaction that I promised you. And now I will, I will describe our result and, and, and try, try to, to convince you that, um, in fact, uh, uh, you can turn a MOT insulator in something very, very different. So, uh, so that's a scheme that I described already. Let me give you some more uh, detail. As I said, no external bar, the system is it isolated evolves with the time dependent Schrodinger equation, uh, which means that the system remains pure at the level of the entire wave function. But of course, observables, local observable, will see a sort of effective bar. Uh, we will take some uh, parameter here. So the hopping rate D is set to one. Temperature, initial temperature is uh, five in this unit. So it's sort of high temperature. We don't expect actually much to happen at that high temperature. And we'll take a uh, half filling, one electron per site, and uh, um, fix for the time being the, the modulation of the, the amplitude of this drive. And so uh, to solve this problem, we're going to use a non perturbative technique that uh, solve dynamics out of equilibrium in the limit of infinite lattice connectivity. So uh, uh, this is called dynamical mean field theory. I won't have the time to enter in the details, but the basic idea is that in this, in this limit of infinite connectivity, the quantum anybody problem simplifies, although it remains highly non-trivial, uh, it, and it maps to an effective single site uh, embedded in a uh, self-consistent uh, bar, which describes the rest of the lattice. So you have this sketch over here. You can imagine that one single side of your lattice uh, 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 would sort of feel the neighbor, the effect of the neighbors. But when these neighbors are, uh, are infinite, uh, you can describe this uh, exactly as an, as an external bath. But this bath, this environment, is highly non-Markovian and is sort of has to be determined self-consistently by studying the property, the local property of, of the system. So if you, if you have questions, of course, you can ask. I, I don't want to enter too much in the details, but that's the technique we're going to use to discuss and solve the dynamics of the Hubbard model. And so let me first uh, give you the, the first results. So we will focus uh, most of uh, uh, the time on the dynamics of the W occupied site. So this is the average number of doublons in my system. So it's this average here over here that you see on the right. And I'm going to compare the dynamics in two different regimes when the interaction, and here I'm talking about the interaction before the drive is switched, is sort of comparable with the opting rate or when the interaction is much bigger than the opting rate. So let me start from, the, from this plot on the left. What you see here is the dynamics of the double occupancy. You start at some time t with some uh, small number of double occupancy. And you see that as a function of time, you rather uh, 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 fast uh, uh, approach uh, stationary state, uh, I would essentially with an exponential time scale that we plot here in the inset. Now, if you zoom in, you see that uh, this, this, uh, this time, this dynamics in fact oscillates at the frequency of the drive, uh, but overall there is a, a, no, a sort of a overall trend that, uh, that brings you to thermalization. Uh, to, to a stationary state. Now, if you zoom in a long time, in fact, these oscillations are completely damp, which is remarkable if you think about that the drive in this problem has never been switched off. So the drive is still going on, but the, lo the local observable in the many body system thermalize. And in fact, thermalize to this infinite temporal state that I was discussing before. The way to see it, well, you see this value, this plateau here, uh, is 0 0.25. So the reason why it's 0 0.25 is that we have a half field bar model. And so there are four states on each side of the lattice, which are the empty, 
the W occupied, the up and the down, and all these states are equally probable in infinite temporal. So uh, the probability of having doublets is one quarter, one quarter. And that's what we uh, got here. Uh, in fact, we even uh, try to see if uh, things like fluctuation dissipation theorem holds, and this is really a bona fide uh, thermal equilibrium state at infinite temperature. On the other hand, if you see what happens at the strong interaction, the situation is rather different. In fact, if you start tuning the, the frequency omega, you see that on the same scale, on the same time scale, the dynamics, uh, uh, look at these red uh, uh, dots here, get stuck into a plateau, which seems uh, pretty far from the infinite temporal plateau. And on longer time scale, in fact, we were not being able to see uh, uh, the second time scale that eventually should bring you away from this pre-thermal uh, pre -thermal plateau. But what we discover is that as you tune the frequency of the drive, omega, there is a sort of sweet spot at which this plateau, this pre-thermal flow capable plateau melts away, and you see that uh, the dynamics very fast goes to infinite temperature again. So this, uh, uh, we understand now this as a sort of sharp dynamical transition uh, between different thermalization regime, which is tuned by the frequency of the drive. And I will try to explain a little bit uh, more physically why this is happening. Uh, before that, let me give you a little bit more insight on what's going on uh, uh, by looking at this, uh, 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 the spectral signature of this transition. Now, let me guide you through this plot, which might look a little bit uh, um, uh, messy. So you have three panels over here and we are looking, let me focus on the first one. Here we are at frequency below the sort of sweet spot that I told you, this threshold. And what we're plotting here are in blue, like this line is the spectral function. So essentially the density of state, the interacting density of state of the bar model. The, this uh, shaded blue area is the occupation uh, uh, of the uh, single particle modes. And the uh, dash red light is the ratio between the spectrum, the occupation and the spectrum. Now, if you remember your, your, your StatMec uh, uh, textbook, these two uh, quantities should be related in thermal equilibrium by the truly fluctuation dissipation theorem by the Fermi distribution function. And in fact, you see that this is quite not the case. This red dash uh, line doesn't look at all like a Fermi distribution function. However, uh, if you sort of restrict uh, your uh, uh, this uh, and look only around the frequency of the upper band over here, you kind of can see a sort of uh, effective uh, thermal uh, distribution. Now, let's try to change the frequency of the drive and move closer to this resonant condition, the sweet spot. In fact, you see that at the omega star at this, trans at this frequency, the distribution function exactly becomes flat at any frequency which means the system thermalized to infinite temperature. Because in fact, if you put beta equal to zero, equal infinite temperature, you should expect a Fermi function, which is completely flat. And now even more interesting, what happens if you try to go a little bit above this resonance, now you should sort of look at, um, with, uh, you, you should sort of look at this dashed line vertical here. You see that in fact, uh, there is a little bit of shift of this peak. Here is a sort of peak toward lower frequency. Here is peak toward higher frequency. And you can see that very clearly if you look at the uh, distribution function, the red dash line, you see the slope that here is, uh, is negative and here is positive. So there is a change of slope as you change the frequency. And this change of slope tells you that in fact the system uh, gets wrapped into a state with effective negative temperature. You can in fact see that this peak being shifted over higher energy, it means that the system develops population inversion of the upper Hubbard band. So this is the highly non-equilibrium state. Thermal equilibrium would tell you always that lower energy are more populated. Okay? Instead here, we are in a very unusual situation which where higher, higher energy excitation are more, uh, more populated. So there is a simple mechanism to understand what's going on here. And this has to do with, the, again, these doublons and how much time does it take to destroy a doublons and, uh, and make it decay? So doublons, when the interaction U is very large, uh, in order to make a doublon and to break it, uh, you need to uh, create a lot of single particle excitation. And uh, in fact, uh, uh, you can convince yourself by doing a perturbation theory that the lifetime of the doublon is non-perturbative in the bandwidth of the single particle density, uh, the single particle excitation. This is something that in cold doublons have 
has been observed experimentally, and you can sort of convince uh, of that um, in the, with, different, with different theoretical approaches. So now what we have is a situation in which when interaction is very large, these doublons are very long lived. And so that's why the pre-thermal plateau, uh, the system gets stuck into this pre-thermal plateau when the interaction is uh, very large with respect to the opting. There is a rain regime in which the drive creates a lot of doublon, but then, then this doublon cannot decay because to decay, they need a long time. Now, the, the sweet spot uh, can be sort of understood as a sort of uh, uh, system borrowing energy from the drive of order omega. And so when the energy of the drive omega is resonant with the typical energy of the doublons, you expect the system to sort of thermalize very rapidly. And so that's exactly what we have been seeing uh, before. So now the question comes and says, okay, you have sort of a very weird non-thermal state with population inversion of uh, the upper upper bands. You have these doublons, which are non-thermal. What are we going to do with that? And especially how the state is stable to dissipation. And in fact, you can imagine that in most of these uh, pump probe settings, on some time scale, the lattice will be there to suck up the energy and make the system relax. So we decided to address this question and add the dissipative coupling to our Hubbard model. So the Hamiltonian we're studying now is the uh, previous Hubbard model we modulated interaction. And now we have a set of harmonic oscillator on each side that describe a bosonic bound. Okay, so we, we, we can solve this problem essentially with the same techniques as before using non-equilibrium dynamical mean field theory. I will not enter again into the details, but I will highlight this result that uh, I, I think it's extremely, extremely striking. So what I'm showing here is the same double occupancy as a function of time. And now I'm comparing the dynamics for three different values of the bath, system bath coupling. So three different values of dissipation. So for lambda is equal to zero, this uh, sort of dark red line, we are back to what we discussed so far. So you see a pre-thermal plateau, which is far from the infinite temporal state. Now, if you put a strong dissipative bath, lambda order one, you essentially uh, suppress this uh, pre-thermal plateau. However, if you weakly couple the system to a bath, this would be the, the, the light red curve, uh, uh, you see something rather striking, as I said, and it took us a while to understand what was going on. You see that this double occupancy overshoot the limit of 0 0.25. And in fact, goes to some stationary state that is above this limit. And in fact, if you tune the frequency uh, of the rest of the drive around this resonant point, you find an entire region, an entire frequency region where this double occupancy, where there is an anomalous production of double of double. Now, I'm stressing this a lot because this is an extremely non-thermal effect. This is an field bar model. And no matter what, in thermal equilibrium, double occupancy can be at most one quarter. So the fact that the system goes to this uh, anomalous uh, state rich in doublons means that something is going on and it's, it's kind of weird. So uh, we, we, we look it up in a little bit more in details and now I think we understand, but let me give you one more piece of information to, to, to sort of build the puzzle. So as before, we're gonna compare the spectral function of the system uh, uh, be, without the bath. So this will be the upper panels, lambda equal to zero. So there is no dissipation. That's what I told you before. And you see that this arrow over here show you that there is population inversion. This second peak at positive frequency, the upper Hubbard band is shifted toward a high frequency and you have negative temperature because the slope here is, uh, is uh, of the Fermi function is like this. However, when you put the weak coupling to the bath, you see a complete reshaping of the distribution function of the doublons, okay? Of, of the single particle excitation. So the spectrum, which is this uh, light curve here, doesn't change much. But the distribution function, the shaded area, change completely, kind of goes back to low frequency and the peak goes up. So in fact, what we see from this right panel here is that the temperature of the system has been sort of, thanks to the bath, gone back to a positive value, okay? So the bosonic bath is able to sort of change the population and make this thermalize to a, a positive temperature, but it doesn't change the spectrum, okay? So, so now we're gonna sort of, um, uh, uh, 
wrap this uh, this story into into trying to understand what's going on and and i hope uh, uh, i'll convince you that that what's going on in fact is that we are stabilizing a very anomalous state of dublin so how we understand that so i told you that first of all we are in a regime in which interactions might be bigger than hopping so these dublins are almost concerned Okay, and and now we got, what we are gonna do? We wanna do a, a, a high frequency expansion. That is something you would do in, in flow gate theory, but we wanna do it uh, in a regime in which high frequency is large, but is large because it's resonant with the interaction, which is large, which is very important and very different than the usual one. So if you do this high frequency expansion in high, without the drive, without the amplitude and drive, in fact, this is an old. Uh, is an old friend of ours, is something we have learned in textbook, is schiffer wolf uh, uh, physics that project the doublons out and in a motor insulator and give you an antiferromagnetic Heisenberg model. So in thermal equilibrium, you typically take, take the doublons and trash them out because they are high energy degrees of freedom. What we have to do here is a different game. Uh, the drive has brought us in a subspace where doublons are the key player. So we are not allowed anymore to trash out the doublons. In fact, we would be better to trash out the singly occupied side. And what we do, in fact, is that they write down an Hamiltonian only for the double. Okay. So if you do a little bit of math, you realize that the Hamiltonian for the doublons uh, look like this. And this is an Hamiltonian for effectively bosonic degrees of freedom. You can think of doublons as sort of boson, hardcore boson which hop around with a rate that is essentially v square over u naught and interact, uh, uh, interact with an attraction, okay? So double, a boson R core with an attraction tends to want to fo form a superfluid, okay? So what is this superfluid? In fact, this is also something that was well known. Uh, and this superfluid is nothing but the so-called eta pairing state. So what is the eta pairing state? So back in the days in the 90s, people realized that if you take the upper model, there is a high, highly excited eigenstate of the upper model, which has superconducting correlation, okay? This seems like a fun fact. It's an exact eigenstate that lives in the middle of the spectrum, and you can build it up uh, by using the fact that the upper model has a SU2 symmetry in the subspace of Dublin and Owens. So in fact, if you do a particle load transformation only on the downspin, you can take the, the, the bosonic Hamiltonian that I wrote before, and you can map it into a ferromagnetic Heisenberg model for a pseudo spin that describes Dublin and Owens. Okay? So this is something that was long known since a long time, that there is this, this highly excited state, which is superconductor. And it's a very weird superconductor, in fact, uh, is a, is a superconductor where the order parameter corresponds to the ferromagnetic order parameter in plane and is staggered, meaning it's modulating in space. Uh, so it's ordering at pi pi, it's not ordering at q equal, at q equal to zero. Uh, and the z component is uh, degenerate with chart density wave. So this eta pairing uh, is something that you never see in thermodynamics because it's, uh, it's an exact eigenstate in the middle of the spectrum, which doesn't play any role for thermodynamics. And somehow, what we uh, think we are doing here is that we've managed to find the scheme using this floquet driving dissipation to populate this uh, eta pairing state. Let me mention that uh, uh, this eta pairing is something that is creating a lot of excitement at the moment, and there are several uh, proposals to, uh, to realize that uh, uh, in addition to ours. So the summary uh, of this uh, first part, uh, and that's a little bit the, the take home message, is that we, uh, the, the physics that is going on here is that the periodic drive on very short time scale inject doublons in the upper bands. So you go from an undriven system that is a mott insulator where only the lower upper band is populating, populated to a state which is driven, which has a lot of doublons. Now these doublons are there and you cannot uh, get rid of them because the interaction is large. And so they stay there. But the problem is that the effective temperature is negative. So in this sort of phase diagram that I'm taking from, from this uh, paper from uh, Action, Martin Action Group, essentially the drive is doing this transition, moving us from a positive temperature mot insulator to a negative temperature state, which is rich in doublon. So this is doublon versus inf inverse temperature. Now, the, the dissipation on the other end changes the temperature, brings you back to positive temperature, but doesn't change the double, double content. And so that's where you can get very close to this eta pairing phase, okay? So uh, that's a little bit the picture. 
And, uh, um, uh, and I think this is a more general mechanism, let me say, that for, for stabilizing using driving dissipation, dynamical, um, dynamically stabilizing a highly excited state, which are very unusual and very different from thermal equilibrium. So now maybe I should ask how much uh, I'm doing with time so that I know uh, uh, where I am. Um, yeah, I think we can go, you know, for probably 20 more minutes. Okay, that's, that's great. Okay, so I'm happy to, uh, then to, to discuss and sort of change a little bit the, the, the gear of the presentation and go to a different regime where light also plays the role of mediating and, 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 and controlling, helping to control quantum materials. But here we're, we're talking about quantum fluctuation of the light field. And so this is a, a new frontier that is emerging uh, uh, in theory and in, in experiments. There are several platforms that are trying to do that. And the idea is to sort of sandwich uh, solid state material in between a cavity. There are several ways in which you can do that, there are several ways in which you can do a cavity. Uh, so this is an idea that in atomic physics uh, and the field of cavity QD has uh, been extremely successful in controlling small quantum system to, uh, and, and the, essentially the entanglement between a single photon and a single qubit up to a level, uh, to, uh, to a, an excellent degree. And the idea is to sort of do that with uh, much more complex solid state uh, objects. And so uh, there are several groups I was saying, uh, uh, one in particular in, in Strasbourg is the Ebbesen group is trying, is, is trying to, do, to do that. And there are reports of, uh, of uh, changing of experiment where uh, they were able to change uh, the uh, superconducting temperature through coupling to the vacuum fluctuation the light field to enhance transport uh, through uh, photons and, and so on. And let me also mention that the same kind of effort is also ongoing in the field of atomic physics in, in, and in cold atoms, uh, where uh, atoms can be trapped into high finesse uh, optical resonator. And, and there are, in fact, several, already several reports of dissipative phase transition uh, in, in this context. So from the theory point of view, there are several, several proposals, and I will uh, highlight a few of them. One is the idea of uh, describing a super radiance in quantum material, and I will talk about that in, in a second. So uh, don't worry if you're not familiar with, that, uh, with this uh, language. And then there is uh, the idea of coupling to collective modes, for example, to the X mode of the uh, of a superconductor and to create a cavity Higgs polaritons, or even the possibility of use photons, cavity photons, to mediate the pairing between electrons. Okay, so in order to understand a little bit better, uh, in particular this business of super radiance, let me sort of step back and take uh, take uh, um, inspiration from what is known in quantum optics, which is a, a situation in which the coupling of quantum light and matter has been studied uh, to. Uh, uh, to a high degree. And it's one of the sort of textbook model in, in quantum optics and in many body quantum optics is the decay model, which is the uh, idea of coupling a photon mode, uh, which can be the mode of a resonator, an optical resonator or a superconducting circuit. Uh, couple this photon, this harmonic oscillator, a dagger A, to a bunch of uh, two level system, to a bunch of dipoles. And this is typically described in terms of a collective coupling between the polarization of these dipoles, uh, sigma x, sx, and the electric field in the cavity, which is A plus A dagger. And so this, uh, this model has been studied in, in, various, uh, in various contexts. And, and, and written like this uh, is known to have a phase transition where essentially up above a certain threshold light matter coupling lambda, the system uh, develop an order both in the atomic uh, two-level system sector, which become uh, a ferro ferroelectrically order, and into the cavity sector, which develop a polarization, develops an, an expectation value, and the photon in the cavity becomes coherent. So this is uh, physics of essentially cavity mediated interaction. You can sort of see this Hamiltonian as an effective easing exchange, which is mediated by the virtual photon. Now, this model has been studied a lot, but in fact, it has been also highly debated because it's known that uh, uh, when you uh, write it like this, uh, uh, you are somehow forgetting an important piece of the physics that, is, uh, that has to do uh, with the way uh, you, you couple light, light and matter. 
Um, and then, depending on the setting, you might in, be able to engineer a situation in which the coupling is exactly like that. But in the solid state, typically, you have to include another term, the so-called diamond term. And this leads to uh, various uh, no-go theorem that tells you that, in fact, this super radiance cannot be observed. Uh, and similar uh, effort has been done with, uh, recently with, uh, with quantum materials. So the idea of embedding uh, quantum electrons, uh, uh, electronic degrees of freedom in a cavity can mediate super radiance. And this is something that created a, a lot of interest. And it's uh, now understood that uh, for this to happen, one needs uh, a modulation in the, in the vector potential. But nevertheless, I would say that this trigger us uh, uh, our interest in trying to understand how, in fact, uh, how to couple correlated electrons to photons in order to preserve gauge invariance. And this is something that uh, is rather uh, tricky and I will try to, uh, to explain it uh, in, the next, in the next slide. So uh, we call it gauge fixing uh, and let me, let me explain what is it. So if you, oops, if you take your, uh, your textbook, uh, um, solid state, uh, and you, you know that, uh, a rather uh, safe way to couple light and matter uh, is to do minimal coupling substitution. So this uh, is a gauge invariant way of coupling electrons to electromagnetic field. Uh, basically, you substitute your momentum with uh, uh, a generalized momentum, which includes the vector potential. If you expand this guy over here, you get a linear term in the vector potential, which is the paramagnetic coupling proportional to the current and a diamagnetic term. So far, so good. Now, maybe a little bit less known in solid state is that there is an alternative uh, uh, perspective on this and an alternative gauge, we can call it, in which you don't play with the vector potential and the current, but you play with the polarization and the displacement of the field. So this is called dipole gauge, and you can get there through a unitary transformation. And so this is also a rather standard textbook. And so you can turn this Hamiltonian into an Hamiltonian in which, again, uh, you have a coupling between the matter that is of freedom and the photon, but you have to notice that the shape of the coupling, the type of the coupling is very different. So here in the Coulomb gauge, in this, in this minimal coupling, you have a linear term and a quadratic term. Here, in fact, you have always a linear term in the, in the photon, but the price to pay is that you have self-interaction, a sort of self-polarization interaction. So all of this that I said is fine and is correct in this textbook, uh, the problem is that once you want to write down a model for a strongly correlated system, you have to, obviously, you need to restrict your uh, interest in some orbitals which play the key role. You cannot hope to solve the many body problem when you project your Fermi field over all the Varnier orbitals in your system. So when you do this projection, things get a little bit tricky because, in fact, it's been known that in order to preserve gauging, but that is not so easy. To, so, to write down the light matter coupling um, uh, in the different gauge uh, and preserving gauge invariance. This is something that has been recently discovered in quantum optics, in model for quantum optics, like the, Rabi mo the Dicke model, the Rabi model. You see in this plot that is taken from this um, natural physics paper from, from Norris group, that in fact, as you increase the light matter coupling, the, the, the exact dipole gauge and exact Coulomb gauge uh, 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 and, and sorry, the naive Coulomb gauge and the dipole gauge result sort of start to deviate. And you have to be careful in the way you project to write down a meaningful Coulomb gauge. Mm -hmm. So we try to export this and, and uh, to the solid state context. And we, I think we have a way to implement this uh, transformation, this PZW transformation in a consistent way using projected orbitals. And so the basic message, the, the take home message here is that once you do that in the Coulomb gauge, you obtain a renormalization of the opting uh, that looks like a pyre substitution. You might be familiar with that in solid state. It's a little bit more general, general than pyre, but essentially looks like a pyre substitution. And it's very important here that a photon field appears in an exponential. It's a very nonlinear coupling between matter and, uh, and light. In the dipole gauge, on the other hand, the coupling is always linear, but you have this self-polarization term. So what do we do with that? So to give you an example, we take a model that has been discussed a lot in this context of super radiance. It's an excitonic insulator, which is essentially a two-band model with interaction U between the orbitals and with hopping between the orbitals. And we couple it to light using the two different gauges that I described, the dipole gauge and the Coulomb gauge. 
And we do it in a way that we are sure that these two descriptions are gauge invariant. So you can move from one to the, un the other with a unitary transformation. And now, if you do that, and if you do it consistently, in fact, you recover this result, which is sort of, um, uh, which has been proven in, in, in the literature as well, which tells you that in fact, you cannot have super radiance uh, in a single cavity mode, which is uniform. And there are two ways of seeing that. In the Coulomb gauge, essentially what I'm plotting here is the ground state energy as a function of the expectation value of the equivalent state. You have to have an, only a single minimum at alpha equal to zero, which guarantees that the system remains in a normal phase and the cavity does not develop coherence. And in fact, if you do it properly, you have a nice parabola with the only single minimum. Uh, in fact, but if you truncate and, and you don't do properly, or you expand the pi space uh, and you crank up the light matter coupling, in fact, you find something that tells you the system is becoming unstable. In the dipole gauge, uh, this is even more clear because this self polarization term that I mentioned before exactly cancel the photon mediated interaction and the outcome is that the electron and photon decouple at low energy. And so you cannot have super radiance because the two sectors do not talk to each other. So let me uh, just uh, go toward the end of the talk. I want to highlight maybe the, the, the last thing we, we are actually currently working on and, and then I will close. Uh, and this the idea of using this light matter coupling, now we know how to do it and write it in a gauge invariant way to control topology and control topological phases of matter. And so we take a model there is a, a, a standard textbook uh, model for topological phases, the uh, SSH model from Sue, Schiffer, and Higer. Uh, and it's essentially one dimensional chain of fermions with a dimerized hopping. So you see, you have either a bond with hopping V or a bond with hopping W. And so, as a function of the ratio between these two uh, hopping rate, the system can go through a topological phase transition, which means that essentially, the, you have a gap that closes at the critical point and reopens, but you develop a non-trivial uh, ZAC phase or a non-trivial Chern number. And you can see that by looking at the finite uh, chain spectrum, you see that in the topology, in the trivial phase, the bulk is gapped, but in, in, the, in the topological phase, you have two edge modes, which are exponentially suppressed and there are these two little thing in the middle of the spectrum. So now we ask what happened when you couple the cavity to this, to, to this SSH model. And we do it, uh, as I said, with a full gauge invariant fire phase. So it's very important we keep this phase uh, non-perturbed. So we solve this model uh, in a, um, deca decoupling the photonic and the electronic sector. You can ask me more uh, how uh, this uh, works and when this works, I, I'd be happy to, to comment on that. And in fact, what we find is, is was rather surprising is that the, the, the cavity is able to change the topological phase diagram uh, of the system. The light matter coupling is able to change the topological phase diagram of the system. In fact, you see that this uh, finite chain energy spectrum, the black line that I showed you before, shifted toward a larger value of the opting. And what I'm comparing here, and this is somehow the, really the punchline, is the effect of uh, treating light quantum mechanically, which would be the red, the red curve, as compared to treating the light uh, in a classical way, like this cavity is in a coherent state. And you see that, in fact, uh, this, topo this topological uh, transition is pushed to much higher values of the optic. So the idea is that quantum light is more effective in protecting topological transition as compared to classical light. And we kind of understand that uh, from two facts, from the fact that uh, the renormalization of the optic due to photons is, is milder as compared to the cavity field. And from the fact that the cavity becomes squeezed, which means that uh, you see here, the probability of having n photons in the cavity, in fact, is zero for odd and, and, and non-zero only for even photons, which is a signature of squeezing and a signature of strong classicality of the light field. Um, and let me, uh, with that, conclude uh, that uh, there is, in fact, uh, even more that you can say, and that the topological transition of the SSH appears in a rather non-trivial way in the light that comes out of the cavity. Uh, there is something you can probe in transmission and reflection experiment, and we can compute uh, uh, through the photon spectral function. And so what you plot here, what you see here, are the polaritons excitation, so the mixed 
light matter excitation of the system. And you see that you have three branches of excitation in the trivial topological trivial phase, there are these three peaks. But as you go at the transition, one of these branch disappears just to reappear in the non-trivial topological phase. So the topological transition can be detected by seeing uh, a drastic change in, in, the, in the spectral function of the, of the two. So uh, with that, I think I am uh, more or less done and I hope uh, I am not too much over time. So these are my conclusions. Uh, I hope I convinced you that uh, using periodic drive, uh, you can general, gener generate non-thermal phase of, of quantum matter. And the really take home message is this idea that uh, the phase diagram of many, many, many body quantum system, we are used to look at them in the low energy sector, but in the high energy sector, there might be very unusual state which do not appear in thermodynamics, but can be dynamically populated. An example of that, is this transition from a Martin Sturzo to an ETA pairing superconductor. And uh, the second part of the talk was uh, the idea of using light to do this flow K engineering in a sense, using quantum light and cavity modes. And uh, with that, I think I uh, am done and I would like to thank you all of you for, for your attention. I'd be happy to, to answer your, your questions. Awesome, that was a really great talk. So I will open the floor for questions. Um, so yeah, just unmute yourself and you can talk. Okay, if there are no questions, I think I have one. So it's very interesting, um, the last talk, talking about topological uh, transitions, coupling to photons, it's similar to that paper that you mentioned before in the flow engineering section. So do you know if you can kind of um, relate, let's say this photon, quantum photon and how that compares, to, let's say a classical photon field that's, and you know, basically the effect of Hamiltonian versus this uh, quantum photon. Is there any yeah. relationship between these two? Yeah, that, that's, that's, a, that's a very nice question because it's something we are trying to also work out to, uh, to understand an effect, sort of effective flow K Hamiltonian for that problem. Somehow the key difference with respect to the sort of flow K topological insulator is that here we take a system which is already topological, uh, it's SSH, and we don't break time reversal. The cavity is not a circular, there's not a quantum analog of a circular polarized light, just a, a, it's just a regular cavity, but we study, we try to understand whether classical light uh, described as a coherent state, as compared to, to quantum light described as Fox state, which one is more beneficial to protect, uh, uh, to protect right. uh, the topological properties of your SSH. And we find out that in fact, quantum fluctuation seems to help in, the, in this process and, the, and, the, and the, with respect to classical light. But of course, there, are, there is a lot of interest also in this idea of trying to do, um, uh, to, to sort of create polaritons, which are topological and non-trivial. This is something that was that, what, that people are, are currently working on and there were several works on that on topolar, topological polaritons and, and so on. No, okay. Um, another thing I wanted to mention, maybe you've seen this, uh, there was some work done by Maureen Bukov and Anatoly where they actually looked at the Hubbard model and they were talking about this kind of uh, picture of the, this interplay between the interaction and the, the let's say periodic driving, right? And an, an interesting way they looked at the problem was basically, if you go into a rotating frame with respect to the interaction, you effectively get a new drive and you get like basically this competition between the, the two effective drives. So it's, it's it's a, a absolutely, absolutely. In, in fact, I would say that uh, this construction um, uh, is uh, this construction of effective flow K. Uh, I might have even a slide over here somewhere. It's very much, uh, mm, uh, yeah, here it is. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's, much, it's very much motivated by, by Marin and Anatoly work, uh, with the difference that uh, we sort of look into this regime where doublons. Uh, 
are really um, uh, the uh, important degrees of freedom. But we played exactly the same game. We first went to a rotating frame at the frequency of the drive. This immediately creates a sort of chemical potential for the doublets, which tells you that this, there might be something going on at this resonant condition. And then we, we, we derive the, the Schiffer-Wolf uh, uh, um, uh, effective flow Hamiltonian that brings us to the eta pairing. So that's absolutely uh, uh, correct and, and, and very, I think that was a very nice uh, work. And we use it to, um, to uh, interpret the, um, the, our result. The important thing to say is that the MFT is completely non-perturbative in the frequency of the drive, in the amplitude of the drive. And so, uh, uh, this serves us as a guide, uh, but of course, uh, uh, the MFT is able to capture even to work even in a regime uh, when the high frequency expansion would break down, which is thermalization. So, mm -hmm. we, I showed you that the MFT showed thermalization to an infinite temporal that it would be hard to see in, in the effective picture, uh, Hamiltonian picture. Right. right. Yeah. No, very cool. Uh, yeah, I think we have another question. Yes, I have a question. Very nice talk. Thank you. It was really clear. Thank you. I have a Thank couple you. of, of questions. One, one question and, and, and a request. The question is in the second part of your talk, when you were talking about quantum light, you didn't take into consideration the polarization of the light, the polarization of the photon in all these transformations. How does it play a role here? That's okay, thank you. Yeah, do you should I reply to this first? Okay. Yes. So, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So absolutely, that's a, it's, a, it's a key point. We we uh, in fact uh, we do not consider we consider just a, a linearly polarized light. We do not consider circularly polarized light, which can uh, play a major role. In fact, uh, in the classical analog that I was mentioning at the very beginning, circular polarized light was used to break time reversal symmetry and create a topological state without the need of a magnetic field. Here, we don't wanna do that, but rather, as I said, we want to understand how robust is the topological phase of the SSH with respect to the uh, decoupling to light. So what we focus here is mostly uh, uh, the fact is we want to treat the coupling to light in a non-perturbative way by solving the full pious phase uh, of the problem, which is something that is rather hard to do exactly. You see, this uh, is a very non-linear. If you look at the photon, it's a very non-linear Hamiltonian. You have higher powers of the photon field. And so, um, so to deal with that, uh, uh, we uh, use this ansatz in which electrons and photons are factorized with this, this disregard a little bit of entanglement between the degrees of freedom, but in the larger limit, we think uh, capture the essential physics. Because the natural follow up would be if the polarization would couple to the spin of the fermions that we have to So here, yeah, that's also, that's also absolutely. Uh, uh, Relevant, the, the, the point to say that uh, in this model, we are considering uh, um, spinless fermions. This is like an idealized uh, uh, SSH Sue Schrifer year uh, model that you can realize with, uh, with fermions in cold atoms more, but actually even with, 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 uh, with uh, uh, graphene uh, nanoribbons uh, nowadays. But, but we have quenched the spin uh, degeneracy, so there is no spin here. But of course, what, as I was saying at, at the very end, what we are planning to do now is to uh, discuss how cavity physics, the photon would couple to a strong correlation, strongly correlated uh, material. And there, of course, spin physics and antiferromagnetism and uh, near the mode transition would be uh, uh, crucial to, to account. So that's something that is for the, for the future, absolutely. And if I may, I have one more question, which is about the first part of the talk, yeah. when um, this treatment with Floquet and, and unitary evolution how can I understand the unitary evolution with the, the fact that the system at the end of the day is absorbing energy? Sorry, I didn't get the last part. Can you repeat? Yeah. Uh, how, yes, yes, yes. How can I make a compatible, compatible 
the fact that you have an a unitary evolution with the flow gate Hamiltonian, and at the end of the day that the system unitary in this in the sense that it's considered as a synonym of flows, while the system at the end of the day is absorbing energy from the drive. So how these two ideas are made compatible? Yeah, this okay, is that's a question that's, that they have forever. In this topic. Yeah, I mean that's a, that's a great that's a great question, and and I, so for me, in a sense, this is something I would call a sort of the paradox of quantum of quantum thermalization. So the point, the way I see it is, is as following: if you look, so there are, there are two slightly different things. Energy absorption will is sort of to me is sort of fine because uh, Hamiltonian is time dependent, so there will be an energy absorption rate. Uh, even unitarily at the full level of the full quantum mechanical level, there is a time dependent Hamiltonian, so you will have a, an energy absorption. The question is whether this energy absorption transforms into heat and into, into temperature and to thermalization. And this is absolutely paradoxically if you think about the many body system as a whole. Because as you said, the system is unitary and the system, pure system remains pure. Now the trick to that, there is the way, uh, if you want, uh, I can say thermalization hypothesis works, is that essentially local, so quantum information can never be lost because it's unitary evolution, but it can be scrambled, which means that it can be hidden in very high, highly non-local correlators that we would never probe in any experiment, but they're there. So if you look at local observable, it's like you're tracing out the rest of the system. And then essentially the system is, is open, it's coupled to a bat, and the bat is thermalizing the system. If you were able to look at very, very highly non-local observables or non-local correlators, you would be able to see that the system never lose memory. And you can think of it, the simplest example is take an eigenstate, a projector over an eigenstate of your Hamiltonian, that thing will never even damp. Right, so it's all about uh, all about few body local operators uh, and taking expectation values of typical middle of the spectrum high energy eigenstate which looks thermal, and that's what ATH tells you that if you take an eigenstate from a chaotic Hamiltonian in the middle of the spectrum is essentially thermal. That's the way, but it's very non it's very non trivial, and I would say we are far from. I would say globally understand it uh, well. I mean, even for Floquet, in particular for Floquet system, the, there are conjectures, there, there, there are studies based on numerics. Uh, there is this picture of ATH, but I think uh, understanding uh, is still, still far. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you very much for the questions. Yeah. Is there any other questions? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, you can just unmute yourself. Okay, good. Uh, great talk, Mark. Thank you. Hi, Sasha. Good to see yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, nice to see you as well. So I say that now you are in the Collège de France. Um, yeah. How first part of your talk? How how this physics is stick to your local approximation? Did you think? For example, you could go, so you're using DMFT local, but what about TJ, which is completely non-local? Would you have, would you get the same physics or different? Um, so, so that's a great question. And of course the answer, the honest answer is that um, uh, we uh, don't know because uh, already class at DMFT is sufficiently more challenging for us to try. Uh, but uh, I can tell you uh, the following, eta pairing uh, is in a certain sense uh, uh, um, uh, captured by, by single side MFT. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a physics of, of local, uh, 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 local doublons uh, which, uh, which uh, form the eta pair. Of course, uh, 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 if you uh, uh, ask me uh, what kind, of course you would miss uh, excitation and fluctuation from special degrees of freedom, special fluctuation. So I would say the key question is whether uh, the lifetime of this uh, metastable eta uh, pairing state uh, would be 
at the same once you include uh, this coupling to, uh, for example, spin fluctuation or magnetic fluctuation, which are not included in the MFT. But I think I, I, I think the point of, of, of the talk in which I built an effective flow Hamiltonian, I think this was meant to convince uh, even those that are skeptics about the MFT, that in fact, uh, there is this eta pairing uh, uh, physics behind. Uh, and, uh, and that has nothing to do uh, with the MFT, but it's more the fact that we are, the, the two ingredients are that we are in a strongly correlated regime, U much bigger than the hopping, and a drive which is almost resonant with the doublons. And so this, uh, uh, I think, is the key physics that gives you eta pairing then whether you can actually go low enough in temperature to get into the eta pairing phase or make it long lived enough. These are questions that of course will uh, depend on how accurately you are able to, uh, to solve the dynamics. And that's something that uh, is obviously on our list uh, as a future, future question for, for that. As okay. you know, as you know very well, the the class class of the MFT out of equilibrium is not as uh, well developed as as in thermal equilibrium. Mm. Uh, thanks. All right. So, any other questions? All right. Well, if that's it, then uh, thank you very much, Marco, for your wonderful talk. Um, and thank you very much. Uh, yes. Uh, yes. See you all uh, next week for our next seminar. Bye bye, everybody. Hey, thank you.